We're going to flex your creative muscles today. What do we mean by flexing creative muscles? Well, as writers, as well as in everyday life, we have to be creative. We have to come up with solutions, whether it's a solution to a plot or to a new book idea or whatever it may be. We want to make sure that we're in creative mode. And to do that, we've got to flex those muscles, just like a, an athlete flexes muscles and works out to get in and get started. You don't get stronger sitting around on your derriere. That's the unfortunate truth. You get stronger by working the muscles. And so today we're going to be working on those creative muscles. So what are they? They go beyond artistic connotations. It's not just about writing or painting or drawing or pottery or whatever your artistic sidelines may be. It's much more than creativity in the artistic sense. It's also emotional, relational, job-wise. And so we want to be able to exercise those creative muscles. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to find the creativity that's within you and give you tools for getting a little bit stronger with it. First off, there's a formula. There is actually a formula for creativity. And Laura Ewald and I have done presentations based on this for librarians and school teachers. And that's where this formula came from because they have to come up with creative ways to reach their students. The formula is take a little inspiration Add a healthy dash of imagination, stir in the information, and lo and behold, you get creativity. That's where it comes from. That's how you can build it. But you've got to start with those three basic elements. One of my favorite um, writers and you'll hear me reference him a couple of times in this session, is Ray Bradbury. And I love that he is not only uh, science fiction, he's not only speculative fiction, he is a little bit of horror, he's a little bit of romance, he's a little bit of travel, all in one man, you know, and if he can do it, so can I. So with him, I learned a lot of things about inspiration. He has this wonderful quote, we are cups constantly and quietly being filled. The trick is knowing how to tip ourselves over and let the beautiful stuff out. So today we're going to talk mm -hmm. about letting that beautiful stuff out. And he says that in his book, The Zen, uh, well, Zen in the Art of Writing. If you haven't read it yet, I highly recommend it. It is in your resource list. The image is from unsplash.com. Um, if you have not been to unsplash.com, it is a, a lot of photographers from around the world who are willing to share their images. Royalty free. You don't have to buy them. You just can use them. And so I love that source just to go through and browse the images for inspiration. You'll see that a little bit later. So where are we going to get inspiration from? Start with collections. Back to my, my icon, Ray Bradbury. Bradbury in the entrance, the, the intro to his program, Ray Bradbury Theater, talked about people asking him how, about his creativity. Where does it come from? How, where does he get his ideas? And he would show you around his office, which, by the way, has been recreated in Indiana. I, I'm road trip. You know, I really want to go to Indiana and see that. He had all sorts of things in there. From toys to, uh, yes, documents of commemorating things, certificates, pictures, all sorts of stuff, newspaper clippings. And he says, I'll never go hungry here. <coughs> I'm kind of the same way. If you look behind me, 
This is my office. I've got Pearl the Turtle, the little stuffed turtle who was the inspiration for my children's books, Pearl the Turtle series. Zebras. I love zebras. There's a picture of a zebra or two zebras over there. Um, I'm not sure where it comes from. I just basically love anything black and white. Zebras and um, piano keys, organ keys, all that sort of thing. Penguins and puffins. And I have all of those. I love all things nautical. So I've got a little rowboat up on the top shelf. I've got lighthouses. All those things to keep me inspired, to keep me delighted, because that's what inspiration comes from. You know, it's God in you. <laughs> so take advantage of the things that give you joy and use them. Photographs. Photographs of places you've been, photographs of places you want to go. You know, in the, the sales world, they called it dream building having those pictures of what you want to achieve in front of you. We can do the same thing with inspiration. This is a photo. Um, <laughs> Killer Nashville is an amazing writer's conference in uh, right outside of Nashville, Tennessee. And this is the, the book room at Killer Nashville. And that gentleman sitting next to me is Otto Penzler. Otto is like the godfather of mysteries. If you notice the books in front of him, he's the one who rescues those titles that have gone into uh, kind of never, never land and puts them together in collections. He has been writing as long as I can remember. And I used to read him, my mother had a subscription to Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine when I was growing up. And I used to read about him in that magazine. He'd have a column there talking about what was coming out, you know, what he had put together, what other people had done. And I got to meet him, to sit down with him and talk with him. And he put his arm around me and wished me well. I mean, you know, when one of your icons does that, it means a whole lot. And this picture is a treasure to me because of that moment. So yes, it's part of my inspiration to remind me that Otto Penzler wished me well, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna live up to that. Copy things. Now, this may sound like a cheat, but I know that Vicki is gonna understand what I'm talking about for sure um, as a fellow poet. When I was growing up, I fell in love with poetry. And there were a lot of poems that I fell in love with that I would have loved to have owned, but I couldn't afford the books. I was a kid. So I copied them in longhand in a notebook. And I still got that notebook buried somewhere in a box from moving, but I've got it. Those wonderful poems that I read growing up that taught me about rhyme and meter and the, the schemes of the different types of poetry. There's something about putting it pen to paper that kind of makes it organic for you. And that's part of what kept me going with poetry was having the, those beloved poems. And I used to be able to recite a lot of them. I don't do, haven't in a long time, but there's just something about having that memory of those wonderful classic poems Shakespeare on down, you know, I mean, not limited to any one. Maysfield and Dickinson and um, Robert Burns and all these people. That keeps me going when it's time to sit down and write a poem because I've got that rhythm in my mind and it inspires me. Study things. The more that you study and see other things. And when I'm talking about studying, talking about detail, pay attention to the detail. You know, I'm real good at going, oh yeah, that was a blue car. I know there are people who have studied cars and can tell you exactly what year model and what month it came off of the assembly line. I can't do that. I haven't studied it. But the things that I love, the things that I care about, I study. And I learn more about them. 
And they, that inspires me to go on with the ideas. And then finally, inspiring music. Um, I'm just going to say, you know, we used to call it a mixtape back in the day. We'd put together a mixtape. Now we put together a playlist on one of the streaming <laughs> services. But the music that uplifts you, the music that makes you happy, that gets you going, one of my favorites, and, and feel free to go listen to it after the session, the theme from The Greatest American Hero. You know, believe it or not, I'm walking on air. I never thought I could feel so free. That's the kind of idea that keeps me going. So find those songs that uplift you, whatever they are. You know, my playlist isn't going to be the same playlist that you listen to. But find those songs. And if, if it's, you know, if it's classical music, that's fine. I love classical music. But whatever it is, classical pop, rock, hip hop, you know, have some of them handy so that you can pull them up at a moment's notice. So how are we doing? Everybody okay? Any questions about what we've done so far? Great. Okay, then let's keep going. Talk about imagination. Imagination is what you do with all that inspiration. Where you use it and where it goes from here. Where do you get it? You read. Stephen King has famously said, if you don't have time to read, you don't have time to write. So read. Read in your own genre. Read in other genres. Read modern, read historic, read newspapers and magazines and all of those good things. Visit, visit lots and lots of places. Erica Spindler um, is a, eh, she's the New York Times bestselling author, so I guess she kind of knows what she's talking about, right? Erica Spindler loves to get out and go to coffee shops. We've had her a couple of times at our Sisters in Crime meetings. Um, she likes to go sit in coffee shops to work because it gets her out of her normal world, but also because she can sit and listen and kind of overhear bits and pieces of conversation, how different people talk. When we're writing, those conversations are such an important part. And getting the dialogue right, we don't want it all to sound like us talking. So how do different people talk? When you visit other places, you hear other voices. And that gives you a great, great way to do things. Attend. The more things that you attend, the more viewpoints you'll get. And I'm not saying you have to use every single viewpoint because there are going to be some people that you just go, ah, I can't buy that. And that's okay. But you heard it. You know what other people are thinking. You can use that in your imagination for a character. You know, maybe you're going to have an obnoxious character in your story who's going to be, uh, don't like that. You know, don't like that guy. But now you've got a model for him because you attended something where you saw someone like that. So don't be afraid to go out and visit and attend events to get those things ready. Borrow from the arts. And Vicki, I'm sure you're familiar with ekphrastic poetry, where we build a poem writing about some other art form, whether it be a painting, a sculpture, a, a vase, doesn't matter. It's something that inspired us. Sometimes it's a, a writing, something in the writing arts that inspires us. And when we borrow that kernel of an idea and let our imagination run with it, then, wow, we've got our imagination on full burner, full afterburner. Let's do jets. We'll be on afterburner. 
because we're going to just rock it off out of here with our new tools after we've flexed our creative muscles. So borrow from the arts. The more you look at the arts, the more you take from the arts, whether it be a photograph in a book, on a magazine, on unsplash.com, you're going to see things that will inspire you and spark, spark your imagination and send you off running. Observe your world. When you observe your world, you can write things that are cognitive, well, not cognitive, um, relating to your world, relating to the world around us. You know, and I have a lot of my writing buddies who went, you know, I don't even want to write about the last two years because I don't want to write about COVID. And that's okay. But observe the changes in the world, how things went differently? How do we shop differently? How do we communicate differently? All those things that we observe and look forward to coming back to normalcy are things that we can use in our imagination. We can use to get that next idea going because that's what imagination is, getting those ideas in gear and getting them out there, there to work. Also, when you observe your world, you have the opportunity to find, ah, that's something that I can use. That's something that will be a good plot. Um, after my mom passed away, my friends took me on a daylily driving tour up in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, where folks who raise daylilies, either commercially or recreationally, have their gardens on display. And you can drive up and walk through and view those, those beautiful gardens. It takes place around Memorial Day. So if you're interested in daylilies in the Mississippi area, check out Hattiesburg for the daylily driving tour. But on that tour, one of the gardens that we went through had a lovely older lady. It was her garden. And she showed us around. She was so gracious and so kind. And as we were walking around, I came around a bush. And as I came around a bush, I just had this sudden, what if there was a dead body there? Or what if there was somebody laying in it and happened to be dead? Well, that became Death in the Daylilies, my first novel, the first of my LOL to the fourth power mysteries. That lady became the model for one of the main characters in the book. Just her graciousness, her demeanor, her kindliness, she became one of my characters. Look at what's going on around you. And what do you see? What could you see? You know, all you mystery writers, what could you see? What could be there? Now, I actually kind of thought about doing a, a role play here, but I'm not going to do that to you. My plan was a noise. I would excuse myself saying, oh, I'm supposed to be alone in the office today, but maybe somebody else came into work too. Let me go let them know we're in the session. And then I was going to scream. Okay, I'm not going to do that to you because I suddenly realized that somebody might call the cops. They might panic and think it was real and call the cop. But what if that happened? We're sitting here in a webinar. What if the speaker got up and then you heard a crash or a scream? What would happen? What could that be? Where could you go with that story? Don't be afraid to look around you and then just kind of tweak it a little. Observe the world. Play a game. Now, I'm just going to tell you I love puzzles. That's why I write mysteries. That's why I read mysteries. I love solving the puzzle, figuring it out. 
there are games that you can play. And you know what? The kids online don't have exclusive rights to them. There are word games. Things like, oh, here are five letters or seven letters or whatever. What uh, words can you make out of these? And, you know, we used to play categories, categories back in the day on paper. Now you can play them online. And as I'm going through those, it always intrigues me the relationships between groups of words. Things like anagrams. I love anagrams. Note and tone. Well, what tone did the note strike as the reader read it? What note did the musician hear when the bell sounded its tone, sounded its tone? Things like that, that just kind of, the ideas pop into my head as I'm playing with these words. And it's like, okay, all these words use the same letters, different meanings. What can I do with them? Play word games. You'd be amazed at the imaginative ideas that come out of them. Play what if. Now, I mentioned a few minutes ago, what if I got up and walked off? What would you think about that? What if I came around that bush in the day bear, day lily garden and there was uh, someone laying face down in the, the flower bed? What if? And you can what if in a lot of different ways. What if Napoleon had been born female? What would that have done to world history? Alternative history, you know, has been a great genre for a lot of speculative fiction writers. Don't be afraid to employ those ideas. What if you didn't go to work today, you stayed home? What might happen at home? Using those what if ideas will help you to flex those muscles and get going in other directions. Now, I, on your list, uh, in your resources, you've got a list of potential games. My favorite one, I have to admit, is speed dating. Speed date your characters. If you've got a two-minute window to have a conversation with your character before you have to move over to the next one and get their point of view. What would you discover in that two minutes? What would you want to have asked them that you forgot to ask them before your time was up? And timers, by the way, egg timers or um, computerized timers, whatever it might be, are great tools when it comes to playing some of those games. The gender bender, that, that's what, you know, like if Napoleon had been born a woman, what if Josephine had been the man? What would that have done to history? What if things were different? So take advantage of those possibilities with your imagination. Just kind of let your imagination run wild. Make all the notes. Jot it down as you're going, just kind of brainstorming. And then go back and pick out the ones that will work best for your work in progress or your next work if you don't have a work in progress that needs it right now. Okay. Um, let's see what else. Oh, species swapping. I love that one. Um, you know, we talk about personification all the time, how we tend to make animals, we tend to attribute animals with human tendencies. Well, guess what? We don't have to do human tendencies. We can do some other species. You know, remember the old movie, The Mouse That Roared? What did they do? They swapped some of that species capability, the species attributes. 
that's the kind of thing that the species swapping can do for you. And when you do that, when you, and it doesn't have to be an earthly species for that matter, it could be a science fiction species, an alien. When you do that, you start opening up realms of imagination, ways that you can do it all over the place. Okay. Now, I want you to close your eyes for a moment. Okay, because we're going to do a little bit of imagination building by experiencing your world. So close your eyes. Take a deep breath. What do you smell? What does it bring to mind? Is it pleasant? Is it unpleasant? Does it bring up memories? Does it make you hungry? I know, you know, toast, the aroma of toast will always make me hungry. What do you hear around you? All those ambient sounds that we get busy and tune out. But those are part of building our scenes when we're writing. We need to remember them. What do you feel on your skin? Is it cool? Is it warm? Is it blowing gently? Is it a gale? How does it feel? Pleasant, unpleasant? Stick out your tongue. What do you taste in the air? And I probably should point out that that is also related to the smell because we taste first with our noses and that builds up our, our, our expectation of how it's going to taste. Now, open your eyes. Turn your head to the right. What do you see? Turn your head to the left. What do you see? If you're describing a scene, that's the kind of game you can play from your character's perspective to help build that room. Your imagination builds the scene around them. Now, you're not going to sit there and list it all. But is there something in that scene that you're going to use later? Something that you go, oh, if that's handy, then. What if, and your senses make a powerful pair, so don't be afraid to use them together. Okay. Now, just uh, let me stop for a moment, because I know we had some people that came in after we began. And what I did was I invited everyone to put their link to their web page or their work in the chat if they'd like to make it available to the others. So please, um, if you would like to make yours available, be sure you do that. Okay. So we don't want to leave anyone out who wants to network in that manner. Okay. Everybody okay with imagination? Okay, last thought, be sure and laugh, laugh, you know, laughter is such a wonderful, uplifting thing, I should have it in all the categories, because it's great to inspire you, it's great to get your imagination going, and it's just great to make you feel better, so be sure and laugh whenever you get the chance, so feel free to laugh, that's the whole point today. Now, information. We've gotten some ideas. We've gotten some inspiration. We've got the imagination. We need to flesh it out. We do that with information, with our research, with our memories. So first off, reading and research. 
That's the biggie. I have to admit, I have occasionally thought about going back and writing some historical stuff, 60s type stuff, because, you know, that's when I was a teenager. And I thought that would be fun. And I'm amazed how many things I don't remember about the 60s or I remember incorrectly when I look at, at the research. So, yeah, be sure you do your research and get it right. There's nothing that makes you lose readers faster, unless it's bad writing, but then inaccuracy. You know, and uh, if you look at the number of reviews that comment on, well, they put this in and it wasn't invented until 15 years after. If I write something about a 60 year old kid talking on a cell phone, it's gone. All credibility is gone. So I want to make sure that I remember when cell phones were created, remember what we were speaking on in the 60s and remembering those long twisty cords that we'd stretch into the closet for privacy because there was only one phone in the house and everybody could hear you. So it's a combination of your own remembrance and the research of what actually was. I have a sister who insists on certain things. Now, she's six years younger than me. She insists that the world was a certain way because that's how she remembers it. Well, she's six years younger than me. And by the time she was that big enough to notice things, talking about maybe 11 years difference between my recollection and her recollection. Doesn't mean she's wrong, doesn't mean I'm wrong. It just means we remember different things in different ways. But when you're writing, you're writing for an audience that didn't live your life. You want to make it accurate for them and research will help you do that. Experience your world. Now, we're talking about uh, things that you know today, if you want to write modern, if you're writing contemporary, you want to get out there and know the contemporary world. If I, I grew up in New Orleans, if I'm writing a story about New Orleans and I talk about the NOLA theater, anybody who knows that neighborhood knows the NOLA theater is no longer there. It's long gone. So if I try to put it in the modern world, uh, I'm going to lose them. And if I'm writing about New Orleans, uh, my hope is New Orleans readers will enjoy it. So therefore, I want to get it right. I need to drive that street, see what's in that space now. And it's perfectly okay to reminisce about when the NOLA was there. But, or talk about the night that the ceiling fell in on the NOLA theater way back in the 60s, but I can't put it there now because it's not there anymore. Of course, there's a lot of New Orleans that ain't there no more, as we so fondly say. But go out and experience your world as it is now. Look back on how you remember if it's a place you've been before. And maybe the difference between the two is part of what sparks the imagination for what you're doing. It's a great opportunity. Think Star Trek. When it comes to information, take it all in from as many ways as you can. Remember the opening dialogue to Star Trek, which got changed over the years, where you know Captain Kirk talked about boldly going where no man had gone before. Now they talk about to go where no one had gone before. We want the information that's going to let us do that the pieces of the pie that we can put together and create this beautiful finished product that lets us go where no one has gone before. Another Star Trek source for information was the IDIC, the award that the Vulcan people honored, the, the, uh, the idea that the Vulcan people honored of infinite diversity in infinite combinations, I, D, I, C. That's what we can do with information. Take all that diverse information 
and combine it. And if Becky combines it in her way and Melissa combines it in her way and Dorothy in her way and Vicky in her way, Laura in her way, Dorothy in her way, all, all the different folks, we can take that same information and come out with a lot of different stories, a lot of different worlds that we can create using that infinite diversity and infinite combinations. So when you're talking about information, think Star Trek. Another thing that I want to kind of bring from Star Trek is the idea of organization. Now they had that wonderful computer and you could say, computer, give me, we've got Siri, we've got Alexa, we've got things that are similar. We don't have the vast data banks yet that they had on Star Trek, but you know what? We've got a lot of data out there, a lot of different ways. If you haven't been to your local library lately, whether it's, you know, because they've had shortened hours with COVID, I know our libraries have, had staffing issues because of illness, and we've had to cut hours from time to time. Don't be afraid to go to your library and look something up. And a lot of libraries now have online ways to do it. If nothing else, you can call up and talk to the research librarian and get help that way. Get the information. They can direct you. Uh, some libraries have touchless pickup where you tell them the book you want, they'll check it out to you and put it in a bin outside and you can pick it up at your convenience. So, you know, you're not having to, to go into the library, be face-to-face -face with people. Take advantage of your local library. That's your tax dollars at work, so use them. You know, get the advantage of them. And then organize your ideas, whether it be on a computer, on a wall hanging, uh, you know, a lot of us mystery writers go with the, the crime board like you used to see on Castle, <laughs> where we put all the notes up there and it might be a wall that you wallpapered with post-it notes. That's okay. But organize your ideas so that you can go back and get them later. All of that information does you no good at all if you can't find it later. Whether you do it in a notebook like my old poems, you do it on your computer, do it in a file, whatever it is, make sure that you keep track of those ideas. You know, I think all of us have had the experience of half awake had that really, oh, that would be a great idea for a story. And then by the time we get up and get over to something that we can write on and it's gone, keep something by your bed so you can write on it. Keep a, a portable recorder, whether it be on your phone, your iPad, something else. I've been known to drive down the interstate talking to my iPad because it came while I was driving. And, you know, I'm not going to stop and write it down in the middle of the interstate, but I can at least talk to the iPad. Organize those ideas. Then when you get to wherever you're going or, you know, you get fully awake, as the case may be, transcribe them, put them in your folder, your notebook, whatever it is, and have them later. I love OneNote. OneNote is a great tool. If you have a Microsoft computer, it comes with Microsoft Office, um, that I can put sub pages in it and so forth. There are lots of tools for that. And you'll find a link to an article in your handout that gives you that information of all sorts of free tools for organizing your ideas because they're no use to you if you can't get to them later. Okay, it's, um, let's see if I can tell you exactly what page it's on. That would probably be helpful. It's the bottom of the second page, the last entry on the second page. Okay, so take advantage. If you don't already have a favorite tool for keeping track of your ideas, feel free to look into those. At the time that I tracked down that link, they were free. They may not all be still available, but use them. Okay. 
Now, in your materials, you have the Creativity Bill of Rights. And I put this because I have people who go, oh, well, I don't know if it's okay for me to be creative. I have to be kind of um, real literal and straight arrow and all that. Baloney. You have the God-given right to be creative. We were created to be creative. So be creative. You have the right to nurture your creativity with art, with music, with information, with whatever it takes to get that creativity moving for you. You have the right to apply your creativity to a variety of situations and circumstances, not to limit it to any one aspect of your life. Feel free to engage your creativity wherever you need it. You have the right to appreciate the creative efforts of others. And I think we as writers, um, we have learned what it takes to get that creative endeavor finished. And that gives us the ability to, to appreciate it a little more. Uh, I appreciate artists. And Vicki uh, is one of those artists that I can't draw a straight line. I truly can't. People who can create visual art, I love. Now, I can paint a picture with words out of this world, but I cannot create a visual picture. So I appreciate their creative efforts, their accomplishments. You have the right to use your curiosity as a divining rod to lead you toward creati creative discoveries in all realms. Now, if you've ever gone back and looked at film of somebody dousing for water, and they've got that strange looking V-shaped, or actually it's a Y-shape, piece of wood that they're following around. And well, curiosity is that for us. We can use it as that divining rod to help us find new information new inspiration. That's what we need to do to let it go with us. You've got the right to express your creativity in any way, anything that's productive, that's kind, that doesn't do harm to others. You know, creativity is not a, a free license to go out and hurt people but to uplift and to help people. So we're not here to do harm. We're do, here to lift up. You've got the right to use your creativity to make your life, your family, your work, your community, and your world a better place. Each of us has that capability. And that's what creativity is all about. When we flex our creative muscles, we can make the world better. I've been so impressed with the creative ways that people have come through this pandemic. You know, the people who made workout gear because the gyms got closed down, they weren't selling workout gear. So they switched over to making protective gear for hospitals. Well, we were short of protective gear that filled a need and kept them in business. That was a creative solution. That's what creativity gives you the ability to do, to solve those problems, whether it be a plot problem, a life problem. You take all those pieces and you put them together and you go from there. Okay. Um, as you are working on creativity, as you're fleshing out your ideas, just as that athlete starts out with a basic exercise and then builds on it, you can do the same thing. You start with a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of imagination, a little bit of information, and you mix them together to build that next layer of muscle. Don't feel that just because, oh, I'm, I finished chapter one, I can quit. No, no. Just because I finished that short story, I can stop now. No. Keep going. Keep using creativity. 
Keep building creativity so that you're going forward, constantly building, constantly getting stronger, getting better. That's what it's all about. Um, By the way, if you're not part of a group, and I know a lot of you are because you got here through (laughs) groups that I sent to, but if you're not part of a group, become part of a group. That feedback, that encouragement that you get, someone to ask the questions of when you run into a, a, a brick wall, someone who's been there before, that's the people that you want to associate with to help you build up. Okay. Um, I see we've got some things in the chat. Let me just check quickly. Okay, we've got, oh, lots of people have put their information in there. Am I a punster? (laughs) Sometimes, sometimes I have to get down through Becky's. Oh, let's see. And thank you. You um, answered it because I was trying to find out if you were a pastor or a planner. Oh, Oh, (laughs) yes. Yes. Uh, I am kind of an in-between. I am half pantser, half plotter. That's the thing. Uh, I start out with a basic idea of where I'm going, and then I fly by the seat of my pants from there on. Uh, I saw... I, now, a little backstory on death in the day lilies. I loved day lilies. My grandmother had day lilies, but I knew nothing about growing them other than I knew that they came from corms, not seeds. I had to learn about day lilies to write the book. And that was a lot of research. As I was going through the book, through the, the research, I was like, okay, I've got a body. I've got a dead back. I've got some ideas for why, for motive, but what am I? And the, the answer came to me through the research. It was a totally different motive and a totally different killer from who I started out thinking it was. So yes, I had planned, but then off it went <laughs> and took its own course. So that was the seat of my pants or part. The real reward came when I got a a contact from someone who was the past historian of what is now the National Daylily Society. They used to be the National Hemorocalus, I I can never say it right, society. But I got an email from him saying a lot of, of books that I read that have daylilies in them get it all wrong. You got it right. That was such a rewarding email. I saved it. Yes, I printed it out and it's in my file because that meant the world to me. This is someone who is a professional daylily grower saying, you got it right. Now, the trick was balancing all that information about daylilies with the plot. So my lead character didn't know a lot about daylilies. So she had to be learning it as we went rather than me spouting it as a lecture, she was going, oh, look what I found out. And some of it was other characters teaching her. Some of it was her research. But what came out was I figured out what the motive was based on that research. And it wasn't the initial motive that I thought it was going to be. That turned out to be um, not viable in the, the, well, it was viable. Okay. I could have gone with that. It would have been a less interesting book. So take advantage of the opportunities that you have when you're doing that information, when you're researching the information. Don't be afraid. You can be a plotter. You may have a, a line by line outline. But if you get to a point where the information says, hmm, you need to change that, it's okay to change your outline a little. 
perfectly okay. Great comment, Becky, thank you. Anyone else? Let me jump up here. Ah, yes. Oh, thanks, Melissa. She put the link in. Sisters in Crime Tornado Alley chapters are doing a podcast where they interview with regional writers. That's a great one. Um, I have had so much fun through Sisters in Crime. Many of the chapters are offering virtual sessions these days. And being able to tune into those virtual sessions and get perspectives from all over the country. The other night, well, was it Wednesday night, Thursday night, Thursday night, it was a former CIA agent, Carmen Amato, talking about uh, from one of the South Carolina chapters. Uh, I've had a virtual tour of Pompeii by one of the Sisters in Crime in California who has been there. There are lots of opportunities out there. And if you write mysteries, if you write crime in any way, shape or form, and you're not involved with Sisters in Crime, you're missing a great opportunity because there are so many and they're free. They, you know, they put it out there and say, hey, you're invited, just register. They publicized mine for me. That's how a lot of you found out about today. So, Take advantage. If you belong to an organization, get the feedback and also take advantage of the coming together. As Laura pointed out, um, when you come to an, a session, it may not turn out to be a lot of detail that you need, but if you just get one good idea, it was worth your time, particularly if it was a free session. You know, yeah, if you paid a lot of money for it, you want to get a lot of money's worth out of it. But if it was a freebie and you just get a little bit of an idea, then go with it. Melissa, let me unmute you. Or are you unmute yourself? Melissa has her hand raised. Oh, I just wanted to say, since you brought up Miami, um, that um, one of the Sisters in Crime uh, officers, uh, Vanessa Lilly, she just did a, she just did a, a seminar on how to use uh, Bookstagram. Anyway, uh, she's originally from Miami, Oklahoma, even though she writes about Rhode Island. So <laughs> I just wanted to say that. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Now, and that again, the beauty of these online sessions, I know we're all Zoom fatigued. But the fact of the matter is, it gives us an opportunity to sample things from so many places that we couldn't physically get to right now. I couldn't have gotten from the South Carolina chapter to Oklahoma to be with Melissa today, to Texas to be with Vicki today, or Becky rather, sorry, Becky. You know, and there are some days that aren't. The Ponchatoula Creative Minds Writers Group that Vicki is from, that's an hour and a half away from me. So it's three hours on the road to go to the meetings. I don't make it to every meeting because sometimes I have other things going on. But when I make it there, I always come away uplifted and encouraged and ready to take on the world. That's what do, going to a group will do for you. Laura's group in Picayune, the Picayune Writers Group, that's uh, about 20 minutes away. It's not as long. I don't always get to make it there. But when I do, I come away invigorated and ready to go. Find a group, whether it's a virtual group or a physical group that you go to, find a group. You want that accountability that, hey, what are you writing lately? How far have you gotten on your work in progress? Somebody that's going to encourage you, nudge you to keep going. Somebody that can go, oh, yeah, I ran into that problem. Let me show you how I got around it, how I worked through it. Don't be afraid to go in and meet the people that can help you grow as a writer, help you flex those muscles, help you become more creative. Let's see what's happening in chat.
Oh, Vicky thinks she's clueless. You're not. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, lots of comments about the anthologies of Sisters in Crime. A lot of anthologies. We uh, cr uh, Creative Minds in Ponchatoula just posted one last week, wasn't it, Vicky? Just came out this this past week. Uh, March first. Right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, and that's the second one that we've put together. Tracy is our uh, just retired secretary. That's owner. <laughs> Tracy is owner. <laughs> yeah, that that's. Tracy's hiding over there under a pseudonym. That, that must be her pen name. <laughs> but, okay, let me go. Let's see if we can go back to full view. Can we get everybody up there? Let, let me stop sharing so that we're back. To, there we go. So everybody look around at everybody. And look in the chat. You've got a lot of links there for people's work, organizations. Now, let's just quick show of hands. How many of you are sisters in crime? Okay. How many of you are Creative Minds Writers Group? <laughs> How many of you are Picky Yoon Writers Group? <laughs> okay. Um, let's see, Mississippi Poetry Society. Yay. There are so many wonderful organizations out there. Take advantage of it. Just go and do an internet search for whatever your area is and just say, you know, writing groups near me, whether it be poetry writing groups or mystery writing groups, general writing groups, look them up and then get involved with one. Because you want to get that encouragement, that accountability. Thanks, Tracy. Yes, yeah, Southern Treasures is the name of the Creative Minds group anthology that just came out, and it is available on Amazon. Um, I just blanked out on the name all, while I was talking, but thank you. If you write, you want to be read, correct? You're not just writing to be writing. You want to reach people with your writing. Your writing group can help you figure out how to do it. They can help you learn how to um, get into writing uh, book signing opportunities. That's the kind of thing that's going to help you sell books to help you reach people. They can be there to support you when you have a book signing opportunity. Oh, good point, Laura. She says, don't get discouraged by bad experience. Just keep trying various writers groups until you find one. I just said or um, two or three or five or 10. <laughs> I'm compulsive. What can I say? A little OCD. And, and uh, part of it is I get involved with a group and I love the people in it. And I don't want to give them up just to find another one. So I stay in all of them. But um, that's just me. I'm OCD. Oh, Anne. Anne says she has a friend whose son died and she wants to write a book about the experience of losing her son. Yeah. And what she's gone through, that will help other people who are going through it and don't know. A, they don't know that other people have felt that same way. Or B, they don't know where to go from here. I'm hurting and I don't know what to do about it. Mm -hmm. A book like that can be extremely helpful to a lot of people. Okay. Any last question? I know we're a minute or two over now. And I don't want to keep you chilling. You are welcome to stay if you, you know, want to stay a little longer. That's great. I just would like to say thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It was my joy. Thank you for being here and you. stay in touch. All of you. I mean, some of you guess we're connected through sisters in crime, but we weren't connected personally before. So now we are, which is kind of cool. 
thank you all for being here. And thank you so much for sharing it with those that you shared it with so that, I mean, I got some really cool people here. This is neat. And now, pure plug here. In your materials, you do have information about my availability. So if you've got an organization that you think would benefit from a presentation, let me know and we can figure it out. I have my own Zoom account, so I can come in and do a Zoom. Um, network with each other, stay in touch with each other because we're all in this together and we're all stronger together. Flex those muscles, ladies, do it. Thanks and have a great rest of the day, a great weekend. Keep writing and we look forward to seeing your creative results.